Before we begin the show, I want to talk to you about the All of Us Research Program. Hispanics are the largest ethnic minorities in the USA, up to 18% of the population. However, we are underrepresented in research studies, only 10%. This gap means that researchers know less about our health. Hispanics deserve to be represented in studies so we can know more about our health and be as healthy as possible. As our population grows, so should our participation. Create a better future by participating. Just visit joinallofus.org slash highly relevant. Welcome to episode 159 of the Highly Relevant Podcast, a show about how Latinx pop culture is reshaping mainstream entertainment. I'm your host, Jack Rico, and my feature guest this week... As the chair for the next three, four years, I just want to make sure that theater represents the world that we're in. We're in New York City, one of the greatest melting pots in the world for all eternity. There's no way we shouldn't have that produced on Broadway. And that's what I'm pushing for. It's not about kicking people out. It's about bringing people into the tent. That is Dominican-born Emilio Sosa, the newly minted chairman of the American Theater Wing, the organization that created the Tony Awards. And he's also the first Latino to chair the prestigious organization. He is a Tony-nominated costume designer whose Broadway career includes On Your Feet with Gloria Stefan, Motown the Musical with my good friend Sergio Trujillo as the choreographer, and his Tony nomination for Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. We discuss his humble beginnings as a young Dominican living in the South Bronx, how his ambitions and dreams led him to work with the likes of Spike Lee, Celine Dion, and Wynton Marsalis, and what his vision for America's stages will look like in the next four years. Will it become more multicultural under his tenure? But before we get to Emilio, it's time I give you my weekly recap of the top Latinx pop culture headlines in a segment I like to call Jack Dead. Let's begin with the top movie, TV, and music news of the week. Chilean director Pablo Larraín releases his first teaser trailer of Spencer, the Princess Diana movie starring Kristen Stewart. Benjamin Bratt has joined the cast of the Western Debt for a Dollar. John Leguizamo is releasing a new superhero comic book called Phenom X from Image Comics this November 3rd. This year's MTV VMAs will be hosted by Doja Cat on September 12th. Diary of a Future President, executive produced by Gina Rodriguez, returns for season two. Actor Guillermo Diaz will be recurring on the new Law & Order Organized Crime SUV spinoff. All Harry Potter movies will stream on HBO Max after leaving Peacock. Actress Danai Garcia stars in the crime thriller Baby Money out on VOD August 31st, and Olivia Rodrigo adds Paramore to songwriting credits on Good For You. And in tech and social media news, TikTok and Shopify are working together to add the ability for consumers to shop directly on TikTok. Instagram's swipe up link is no more. They'll replace it with a sticker link now. Netflix is releasing an insane 43 new films from now until the end of the year. J Balvin joins Fortnite and Osuna will be a character in Call of Duty. Google releases YouTube Music Wear OS app for Samsung's new watches. Snapchat's new AR features can identify the world around you. NBC Universal has taken steps to replace Nielsen because of how it counts viewers and Spotify's podcast subscription services are now open to all U.S. creators. Well, Emilio, thank you so much for being on the Highly Relevant Podcast. We are a Latinx pop culture podcast where we celebrate voices of the Latino diaspora that are crossing over into the mainstream. And when I say that, I say that meaning there are spaces that have that we have historically not been allowed to be a part of. And because we know that and because we are no longer silent about that, uh, our voices do matter and our history matters and our contributions matter. And when those contributions are dismissed or become invisible or absent in any way, it's time to uplift those voices when mainstream, you know, for the most part, ignore it. <laughs> First of all, congratulations, Emilio Sosa, for being the new chair of the American Theater Wing. You are a Tony Award-nominated costume and fashion designer. And I think that my first question is, how does it feel to be the chair of the American <laughs> Theater Wing? Well, Jack, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I think the Latin diaspora is within, it's woven between, in, the fabric of our country. It's inevitable. You might, you might ignore it, you may not pay attention to it, but it is there. You know what I mean? It's there. 
Uh, and I'm very proud to be Latino, uh, New Yorker, uh, immigrant, because we migrated from the Dominican Republic when I was a very little toddler. So I understand what that means on so many levels. Uh, what does it feel to be the chair of the American Theater Wing? You know what? I don't think it's hit me just quite yet because. Really? Why? You know, you know why? Because I've been on the board for six years now. So, it's, so I've, I've been doing the work, just not in the public eye. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's just, uh, that's why I say it hasn't hit me because it's, I'm just elevating what I've been doing, what we've been doing for so long. So in that aspect, uh, it's a great honor. It's something that I never, ever dreamt. It's like when you, mm-hmm. you don't have, I never dreamt this, this big for myself. You know, Every, everything, I've never, I mean, I come, like I just said, I come from a very humble Dominican household in the South Bronx. You know, my parents, my dad first came to this country, didn't know the language, very little skills and became blue collar worker, you know? Then he brought my mom and my brothers over. My mom went to work at a factory and that was our lives. Also, and what, and I think what people, I, I don't know if people realize, but when, back when we came to this country, late sixties, uh, early seventies is when my, like my extended family really all came to, to New York, to the US, is that immigrants, we live in a bubble. We may, we may be in New York, we may be in New York, America, USA, but we live in a bubble. We live the bubble of our homes. It's like, I, my house was Spanish music, Spanish news, 24 yeah, seven. When I do. left the house <laughs> is when I really influenced, got the influences from English speaking uh, culture. Yes, we watched the cartoons, mm-hmm. we watched English kind of, you know, when my brothers and I could get the one TV we had and, you know, we, we were the human remote because my dad would say, change the channel. One of us would have to get up from the table <laughs> and change the channel, you know, but uh, I, I think being Latino, being a New Yorker, but never having the dream of a theater mm-hmm. career that was never in my sights as a young man. I was a fashion design student. Fashion was my thing, and it still is in some ex- to some extent. Uh, I fell into theater, and we can get into that later if you want, but I fell into theater, and to be here today as the chair of the American Theater Wing, it's, it's an amazing personal feat for me. But in the bigger picture, it's more about my parents and what they were able, what they wanted their kids to be able to do. And that is to have freedom to be who they wanted to be. And they felt that coming to the U.S. was the best way for us to have that. And the fact that I was able to reach this place, Mm. you know, which is not my end place. This is just a great place to be at this time in my life. Is an amazing achievement personally, but I look at the bigger picture is my family is with me, my aunts, uncles, cousins, the neighborhood I grew up in formed who I am. So I look at I look at it more that way. You know, it's, it's a group achievement that I'm here. <laughs> it's a collective achievement, <laughs> absolutely. No, it takes a yeah, it does. It takes the village. No one makes. <laughs> I always say, no one makes it alone. No matter how much your ego tells you you're the best, it's you, 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 you. When when you really look back and really have to assess your journey, you have to thank all those people who gave you that extra push, and that's something that I am really into doing is giving people that first break. Because if I had, if someone hadn't given me my first break, I wouldn't be in theater and be the chair of the American Theater Wing. <laughs> Before we get into your work at the American Theater Wing and your work uh, in Broadway, you started out as a fashion designer, as a costume designer uh, for Grace Costumes, correct? Uh, I understand that you attribute them for the foundation of your career. So let's talk about your interest. When did you first know that you wanted to get into costume designing and being a part of the fashion world? Look at you doing your homework and shit. 
<laughs> you know, man, that's that's the way it goes, man. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. No, no, honestly. You know what? I, as a young kid, I was I had a traumatic experience at the as a as a young boy, right? And which it forced me to become really introverted and not socialize. So in the third mm. grade, uh, I had an amazing teacher, Miss Torres in the Bronx in the early 70s, uh, used art for me to come out of my shell. Mm. And she gifted me uh, some colored pencils and a plain notepad. And that's how I started being able to be, to express myself. So I learned really how to express myself through drawing. And that became my language of choice. And since that time, since I was in the third grade, I just drew, drew, and drew, and drew, and drew. So when I got to high school, I had to figure out what did I want to do? I knew I loved drawing, but art was never something that was in my in my household at, at a sense where, yeah, we have pictures on the walls, but it, it, you can't call it art. You know what I mean? Uh, so being an artist was not something that I saw as a viable life. It's not, I didn't know any artists. I didn't know what that was. But I remember I was about 13, 14, right before I went to high school. Uh, I used to do a lot of errands in the neighborhood, you know, run, clean stoops, you know, whatever I had to do to put a little pocket change in my pocket. Uh, I, I had saved all my money and I went to the neighborhood uh, newsstand to buy the news, to buy like the Sunday newspaper. I used to buy two, my dad and our landlady who mm -hmm. owned the brownstone that we live in. And then that, that fall, I looked at the magazine rack and I saw a black man on the cover of a GQ magazine. And that was like October, November of 1979. It was the first time a black man had been on the cover of GQ magazine. And I was like, what is this? And I saved up all my money and purchased that issue of GQ magazine. And that's where in my brain, I shifted from just being drawing, from drawing anything to really looking at clothing and fashion as something. Mm. So when I... So, but I was still so not confident in my own talent that I didn't apply for like the specialized high school, like art and design high school, which is where I wanted to go. But I was a young man, didn't know. So I ended up going to more of an academic school because I've always been a good student. So I went to an academic school, but the art was always nudging me. And I found this program through the help of an amazing, you see, someone gave me a chance through my amazing uh, counselor that I could do my academic courses at my high school, A. Philip Randolph, hey, up in Harlem, uh, during the day. Then on the, then on the afternoons, I would trek all the way from 135th and Amsterdam all the way to 57th and 2nd Avenue to Art and Design High School. So I did, I did that for three years in high school. So I was able to get my academic education from A. Philip Randolph, but then I also got an amazing art education from Art and Design High School. And then on Saturdays, I would go to Parsons School of Design in the Village to take an additional class. Wow, so you were committed, was, you were committed. Once I found that fashion was a career and I could be an artist and I could be myself. I just jumped full feet first and really just went all for it. When did you find out that you were great, that you could actually, that you were a professional in your mind, that you can actually make and live making a salary off of your art, off of fashion? Last year. <laughs> ah, no way, really? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I never, I never see myself as being great. You know why? Because I think there's always something to learn. I can always get better. I'm always looking at like, oh, someone is a better illustrator. Like I got to a point now just because the work is a blessing that now my team and I, we work with illustrators. I'm like, gee, if just, if I could just learn, if I can master how to do 
more Photoshop, then I could really do this myself. But in reality, I can't do it myself. It's just too much to do. So after a Tony nomination, after all the awards that you've won, it never sunk in no, that you were really because, good at what you do? You know what it is? I enjoy, maybe I'll twist it around. I enjoy, I love what I do. I love what I do. And I don't see it as work. I don't sit in the space of awards. I mean, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm honored. It's amazing. But I'm always looking for the next thing. Why is that, Emilio? Why? Why do you feel like you always need to search for the next thing as opposed to just being present with all the amazing achievements that you've already acquired? Well, Dr. Rico, as I sit down on my couch, <laughs> I'm sure that I have a lot deeper meaning. <laughs> Let's have a conversation, Emilio. <laughs> Let's have a conversation. What is it? I don't know. I think it's, you know what? I think if I were to be honest, maybe it's about acceptance. Maybe that little boy that wanted to be seen, that didn't have the language to be seen, it still lives within the framework of the man who has achieved all of these great things. And I think if I want to be honest, I think that's what it is. But also I enjoy learning. I enjoy pushing myself. I enjoy, you know, when someone says, oh, you can't do that. I'm like, okay, mm. watch. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it better than anybody. So it's a little bit of ego. You know, it's a lot. It's un, un sancocho. You know, there's a lot. <laughs> Definitivamente. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in there. Before we continue our interview with Emilio Sosa, I want to talk to you about the All of Us Research Program. Hispanic culture is pop culture. We are leaving our mark everywhere from music to food to fashion. One place where we need to make an impact is scientific research. All of Us wants to include our voices in research so we have a better idea of how unique we are genetically and to see if we're prone to other diseases. Did you know that individuals of Puerto Rican descent are roughly twice as likely to develop diabetes as someone with South American heritage? Join the revolution by participating in All of Us. Visit joinallofus.org slash highly relevant. Now back to our interview. Let's break down what happened after Grace Costumes. You ended up being a part of the Celine Dion tour. You toured with the Alvin Ailey Dance Company yeah. with even Wynton Marsalis at the at, at the Lincoln Center. Yeah. How did you end up touring with Celine Dion? Well, you know, that's Celine Dion was later, later, later in my career. I, I came out of retirement just to go on tour with her. Oh, because, my goodness. You know why? Because I had I had never toured. I mean, I had toured a lot in my career, but I had never toured with a huge, like, superstar stadium. She used to fill the stadium. This is yeah. pre-COVID, guys. We're talking about 2008. She used to fill 30, 40,000 people stadiums. And that was an opportunity and an experience that I've always wanted to have. So it came to me, but that came from working with the Ailey company mm -hmm. in the early nineties, because the way it happened was I, the way I got to grace and I'll just give you the quick one. I needed a summer job while I was at school. I was a sophomore Pratt fashion design, and we had to take a, costume history course as a requirement mm -hmm. prior to that i knew nothing about theater i hadn't seen a broadway show i hadn't done nothing i'm 20 year old this is how i tell you that when you work in, when you live in these bubbles even in a big city and broadway was what right down the street for me my friends and i in high school used to run around a Times square and sneak into like the arcades back in the day you know we used to cut class and shit <laughs> so I knew what I knew that area, but I knew I had no idea what a Broadway show was. Wow. It wasn't until I was 20 years old. My teacher, Betty Williams, I always say their names because they named me to be heard. These people really created something. Uh, she made an announcement. Does anyone need a part time job? This costume shop is looking for a shopper. My friend and I looked at each other. and I'm like, hell no, I am not. I'm not a costume <laughs> designer. I know nothing. I'm not doing that. He was like, okay, so he took the job that summer. Uh -huh. I went to design children's clothing at this other company. Well, that gig ended, we came back for the fall semester. He calls me and says, Emilio, I'm leaving to work for another place. You should take this job. These women are amazing. 
they will love you. It will change your life. Hmm. I'm like, I needed a job. You know why? My dad always made us work since we were like 13. There's no, yeah. you, my dad was like, there's no man sleeping here until noon. That's what Latino parents do with us all the time. Say, tú tienes 13 años. Vete para afuera a trabajar. Listen, he was like, no one's going to be sleeping until noon if I'm up at seven. <laughs> so I was like, fine, I need a job. I need a job. So I went and I met these women at Grace Costumes, two Sicilian sisters from Cleveland who opened, who had at the time the oldest running costume shop in New York. So already I'm going into a place seeped in history mm. that was unbeknown to me because I had no idea. I just took it at the job. You know, I was shopping. A shopper, basically what it means is that you shop. They give you a ring of oak tag and they staple, you know, a piece of fabric. They'll write, I need three yards of this. Find it at this place. You know, buttons, zippers, uh, flowers, whatever they needed to complete the job. I was, my job was to buy. You were the bridge that, between the... Uh, yes, the retail and the costume shop, the manufacturing. Uh, and what that did was it, I learned the industry. I learned who had the best zippers, who made the best handmade flowers, who was the belt maker, who did the covered buttons, who did the pleated fabric. I learned all of these worlds from just doing my job and going to these places. And I was notorious for running late because I was so interested in what these people were doing that I would sit there for an hour and, wow. talk, to like the, and talk to the pleader. I would always <laughs> come back and they'll be yelling at me. They're like, we needed this piece of fabric two hours ago. Oh you know? man. But, but I just learned a whole new world and I fell in love with the makers, which, bring, which will bring us back to my spot now at the wing, which is it's so important that we support the ecosystem of the theater, not just producers and owners and performers. There are costume shop makers, they're pleaders, they're mask makers, they're wig makers, they're makeup people, they're shoe people. There's a whole eco world out there that we need to support. So that's how I started at Grace. Right after that, I went on tour with the, my first real professional job was I took an assistant wardrobe job with the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. That led me to two years of touring the world internationally. Wow. That was my first, I was 23. I landed in Russia. My first wow. stop was Russia right when the, right 1990, right after the fall of the empire. So there was still, it was still communist. It was still like you couldn't do certain things. So I experienced that. I went to Europe. I toured for two years. I came back. I said, I'm still don't see myself as a costume designer. So <laughs> I left the tour, came back, started working fashion, worked at Calvin Klein for a little bit, started styling music videos because I have a lot of friends. Who were and you like designed that. for Salt and Peppa, MC Light, Kid and Play. I did all of that because you cause understand that Kid and Play to us in the '90s, man. I know. That was I know. everything. House party. It, we wanted to be Kid and Play for a long me, time. Kid and Play, Salt and Pepper, MC Light, CC Peniston. Uh, built a hope because my friends were in that business because they were all film students at NYU who ah. were moonlighting in the in the music video world, which had just started to happen. You know, it had just started. So all these kids from NYU were beginning to direct music videos. So I became really good friends with a whole bunch of them. And I'm friends with them to this day. They're my closest friends. Wow. So, but then I was like, oh my God, I don't know. I'm always restless. Oh, I don't know if I want to be in the music <laughs> industry. I still want to do fashion. So that went on and on and on and on and on until I met my, uh, my biggest mentor that I met was the great Jeffrey Holder. Tony Award winner for The Wiz. He directed and designed the costumes. He was the Uncola man. If anyone, if any, anyone's parents remember Seven Up, uh, I went to his house and he was. I he saw that I was like not sure of my next step, mm. and he was like, "Emilio, you could be a brilliant costume designer if you focus." Mm. I was like, "Okay, I'm going to be a costume designer," and. By, by miraculous 
I met George C. Wolf at an event where I had designed costumes for Complexions Dance Company, which was run by people I knew from the Ailey Company. Now, and didn't George you C. didn't didn't you meet Spike Lee that that led you to George C. Wolf around that well, time? I had I had met Spike earlier i had met spike before george c wolf because spike spike is amazing spike is like graduate school for people of color to get into the industry <laughs> yeah everyone <laughs> he's the gatekeeper he's like the oracle it's like we need your blessing thank you very everyone, much <laughs> everyone who really had gone to create a career in our industry had gone through spike and 40 yeah. acres at some point in their career <laughs> right at some point so I had met Spike through personal people who knew Spike and uh, he had hired me to style some commercials when he had a, uh, he used to have a uh, advertising agency part that he used to do. So he was to do commercials for everyone. Like he did the Pizza Hut commercial for the Super Bowl one year. I got wow. to style that. So it's I crazy. Had those kind of, I mean, it's, I had those kind of credits. So, but then I met George that December and I had worked with Spike and Ruth Carter that summer. Uh, Ruth Carter, man. Yeah, I was her assistant on Bamboozled and I had met George, Spike and Ruth around the same time. And uh, George offered me a show and Ruth offered me an assistantship. And I knew nothing of the film industry. It was like, I knew nothing. I mean, I was a theater person by that point. And I just wanted to design. And I took my first job at the public theater, which was Top Dog, Underdog, which went on to Broadway with Jeffrey Wright and most death. But Don Cheadle did it at the public. And that's how I started my theater career. Because I met George and... Uh, he brought me into the theater and gave me an interview and I just had a great time with him. Cause I love interesting. I like learning from people who are smarter than myself. That's what it is. That's how I you get better. Be, I don't ever want to be like the, the, the smartest guy in the room. I always want to learn from someone who's done it before me or is doing it at another level. So I, there's a fork on a road. I can go with Ruth and start my film career, or I can have my first show as a designer versus as an assistant. And I said, well, I want to design. So I just said, Ruth, I can't join because I'm going to do this small show at the public. I hadn't done a show before. I had no idea what it was. Uh, and she was very understanding. To this day, I can email her a caller and she picks up my, <laughs> she still picks up my phone call. How cool. Uh, and that's how I started my career. So George gave me a break. You see, it's about giving breaks it's about i've gotten so many first breaks it was my teacher telling me about grace costumes it's about grace costume hiring me it's about the Ailey company taking on someone who's never toured before it was about coming back and doing all these music videos people didn't know who i was it was about meeting spike it was about spike allowing me to grow within the corporate structure i learned from spike how to pitch in a conference room mm. to to add executives I had no idea what that was until Spike put me, you know, he put his reputation on the line, allowing me to talk and make mistakes on his dime. You know, George C. Wolf. What did Spike see in you that you felt was the crucial thing that linked you guys together for him to have that faith in you and to support you the way he did? I think Spike, I don't think it was just me because he's done it for so, he does it for everyone that I think what Spike, at least for me, what I can say is I was hungry. I was ambitious. Mm. I was a go-getter. I was a hard worker. You know what I mean? I would work 12, 13, 14 hours, seven days a week if I had to just get the job done. You know, he rewards hard work and dedication. He likes to see it because he's the, he gets up. He's the first one in the office, even to this day. So to try to beat Spike to the office, you better <laughs> slam. <laughs> you <gotta> slam. <laughs> so this brings us now back to your work at the American Theater Wing. And for yeah. those of us uh, Latinos that 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 are still sort of unfamiliar with the operations and the internal yeah. workings of Broadway, explain to us, and if you can describe exactly, what is the American Theater Wing? The American Theater Wing 
is an organization that supports, and I always keep saying the ecosystem of theater, but not just Broadway, because we have our tentacles in off-Broadway, tours, regional, schools, wherever theater is done, we are there to support through our many, many programs that we support. Mm. We are also chief owners of the Tony Award brand. We are responsible in partnership with the league, where the Broadway League, to award the Tony Awards. You know, the Tony Awards are going to be 75 years old next year. And that's our baby. The American Theater Wing founded the Tonys. So it's the Tonys is one huge part of it. But I think what we do with students and schools is, I think, what makes me happy. And it's mm -hmm. how I started really working with the wing. Because so, I joined in 2015. And shortly after that, Andrew Lloyd Webber created an initiative where we could match. He gave us a huge, generous sum that we can uh, donate and give to students and schools for their school programs and students to go to college. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that for five years. I was always, that was one of the initiatives that I definitely wanted to be part of because that's where you can affect change. Right. Because a lot of the schools were in inner cities, low income students who just needed a little bit of money to be able to pay the tuition, to get books. You know, we've had, we've paid for Marley floors for a school that needed to need a new Marley floor so the dance department can do performances. So then, cause you have to expose kids young, mm. you know, you can't, we can't worry about trying to convert 30 and 40, 40 year olds to come to the theater. <laughs> All right. That's, you know, that's great. That's wonderful. We want everyone to come in, but you have to grow your audiences young because if I didn't see a Broadway play until I was 20, I'm sure there's millions and millions of kids in that same boat. Mm. And if at 20, it changed my life to now, imagine if I were exposed to it earlier, if I had more confidence in the art, if I saw people who looked like me do what I do, I think that I would, not that I would be at a different place because you never know what your road is going to be, but I think I would have been a more confident, younger artist. Interesting. Interesting. So it's about visibility. I think that's what the wing is about. It's about that everyone matters in the ecosystem. Like I was saying, the flower makers, zipper makers, the costume shops, the shoemaker, the scenic shop, the actors, directors, producers, lighting department. You know, people may just, you might only see 10 people on stage for performance, yeah. but there's a hundred people behind the stage or under the stage more likely <laughs> for wardrobe and costumes. So you don't don't let just the people on stage fool you. There's a hundred people behind them that makes that performance happen. And right. that's where that's where change happens. You know, 10 slots seem small, but when you have 150 slots in a production, then you have to realize there's more opportunities that you just don't know. So hopefully in my tenure as the chair is that I bring more focus and more attention to the entire, and this is my buzzword, ecosystem, because we all feed off of each other. We all need each other. And just showing to young people, even older people who want to learn what it takes to be in the theater. And there's so many other choices to make that are, aren't just performing or directing, there's designing. Like right now, there's a huge vacuum of BIPOC people in the costume design, lighting design, set design, production design. Yeah. Those are, and people, yes, fashion, costume design, everyone wants to design costumes, everyone wants to be a fashion designer, but there's so many other careers that we are just lacking people of color in that I that's my push you know catch them in high school and junior high school if you like computers 
You could become a video programmer. Video is the is the latest and greatest addition to theater now. Correct. I just did. I just did Usher's residency at Caesar's Palace. Wow. And the video department, my department was, let's say I had 15 people. Video and set, 30 to 35 people, because it's so technical. Mm. So if you're a video head and you're a young kid in high school and you want to figure out what you want to do, check out video design, because all theaters now are doing a video component. So that's the way I would approach that. If you are an architect student, if you're a student, you like to build things, but you don't know how to get in the business, you know, try architecture. If architecture doesn't work, try set design. You can build your own world in theater. There's so many careers that we need representation that's not just in front of the camera. In front of the camera is the easiest one to fill. Right. The harder ones are the ones where people don't see you, but your art is integral to the final product. We're coming to the fall. Uh, Broadway's about to start again. We have the Delta variant that's uh, making things a little bit more difficult for us to enjoy our theater. What are your plans for this year with the American Theater Wing? I know that the Tonys are coming up. Yep. Um, we know that you have a vision to support voices of color. Um, how do you see the next five years with your leadership at the wing? What does Broadway off Broadway, what does the theater in America look like in the next three to five years under Emilio Sosa? I think what, what it is, I think what we need to, the theater has to represent the world it's in. I can't say there's a silver lining in the year we just went through because we lost so many lives and so many people's livelihoods were disrupted. But one thing it has taught me, at least I can say, is that things will never be the way it used to be. There is no going back. Mm. So we have a unique opportunity to create theater in a way that can reflect the world we live in. And that starts with telling the stories that represent everyone. It's about, like I said, it's about bringing in people who were excluded from the table. It's not, we're not kicking anyone off the table. So people need to stop worrying about that. Oh <laughs> right. my God, it's gonna be a takeover. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know. They get it all confused. Like, no, wait a minute. No, it's about no. equity. It's not about it's replacing. <laughs> we just want our space at the table. If you right. have to make the table bigger, it's like, you know what? It's like, if you buy a, a table, for four, right? Your family expands. What are you going to do? Not feed them? You're going <laughs> right. to put another leaf on the table. Right. And you're going to keep adding because that just makes your family greater. If you can support the people who support you, that they see themselves on stage, that's how you grow your audience. And that's all we want to do. That's absolutely true. We just want to be represented. We just want to make sure that we're in the room for the conversations that need to happen because we are not going back to what it was. Oh, I remember when that is gone. That is gone. No one is going back there. We need to create a space, spaces, because not just Broadway, it's a trickle. It's regional. It's local. It's because I always say, don't just focus on Broadway. If you live in a city, support your community theater, because that's theater in itself. You have to support your artists. You want to get, if you want to see, be the change you want to see. I know that's kind of corny, but that's what it is. If you want to see something change, you have to become active in it. So as the chair for the next three, four years, I just want to make sure that theater represents the world that we're in. We're in New York City, one of the greatest melting pots in the world for all eternity. There's no way we shouldn't have that produced on Broadway. And that's what I'm pushing for. 
is equity, is diversity, but it's also inclusion. It's not about kicking people out. It's about bringing people into the tent. And just before I wrap up here, here are three land tracks you might want to add to your playlist this weekend. Funk Aspirin, Seema Funk E. George Clinton. Gemini Amor, Yoandri. Psicodélico, Selle y Giorgio Silani. That's it for episode 159 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I'd like to thank Emilio Sosa for being on the show. And if you like this episode, please share it with your friends and have them subscribe and leave a review. You'd be helping us reach many more people. If you'd like to get in touch with me, reach out to me on Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. I'm Jack Rico. See you next week on another episode of Highly Relevant. Highly Relevant.